pass from me. Let this cup pass from me. If it's possible, if it's possible, and, and the reason that there was no answer is because there was no other way. It wasn't possible to save humanity and for Jesus not to go through this experience. So he prays first time, listens for an answer, no answer. Prays the second time, listens for an answer, no answer. Prays the third time, listens for an answer. No an because there's no answer to that prayer. If humanity is going to be saved, this is the only way. This is the experience, this nuclear, spiritual, cataclysmic, never-before-seen, never-before-experienced thing that's going to have to take place. Now, Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 18 said these words, No one takes it from me, but I lay it down. Speaking of my life, speaking of his life, no one takes my life from me. Notice this, I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This is a fascinating idea here, because God, if he chooses and insists upon remaining in all of his grandeur and all of his glory and all of his divinity, God is impervious to any creature's assault. Right? What, what could a creature ever do to God? And so Jesus says, hey, listen. If, if, if my life is going to be laid down, it will be voluntarily. Now check this out. When Jesus was standing before Pilate, Pilate was peppering Jesus with questions and Jesus was just standing there silent as it says in Psalm 53 that he, he didn't open his mouth. He wasn't going to get into a debate with, with Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. And uh, actually that's going to come in just a second. Let me give you that and then I'll come back to this. Pilate said to him, oh, what, you're not going to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to crucify you and release you? See, Pilate thinks this is just an ordinary... He's dealt with people like this before. People who are obstinate, people who aren't going to participate, with, uh, participate in the process. And so Pilate's like, don't you know who I am? D don't you know that I have the power to crucify you and I have the power to release you? He's trying to scare what Jesus says here. But when Jesus finally opens his mouth, this is what he says. You would have no power at all against me unless it had been given to you from above. If I hadn't consented to be standing here, you couldn't do anything about it. Right? And, and it's fascinating because in the narrative of John 19, Pilate doesn't say anything to that. He actually tries to get him released. He's like, uh, yeah, let's get this guy out of here. You know, it's just like, it, it, he says, hey, don't you know who I am? He's try, trying to do the Clint Eastwood thing, you know, the tough guy thing with Jesus. He's like, hey, listen, don't you know who I am? I have the power to crucify you. I have the power to release you. And Jesus is like, you have no power. The only reason you have any power in this situation is that it's been given to you from above, i.e., my Father and I and the Spirit have agreed that this is what would happen. When Jesus came into the Garden of Gethsemane, when the, when the mob came into the Garden of Gethsemane and they went to arrest Jesus, Jesus' uh, disciple Peter took out his sword and went to try and chop presumably the head of one of the assailants off, but he only got his ear. Jesus turns his attention to Peter and says, hey, don't you think that I could not right now pray to my father and that he would provide me more than 12 legions of angels? All of these texts communicate to us. I lay down my life voluntarily. You would have no power unless it was given to you from above. And don't you think I could get out of this situation if I wanted to? Every one of these texts is saying the same thing. Jesus is in Gethsemane. Jesus is at Calvary. And Jesus is nailed to a cross for the simple reason that he is choosing to be there. He is voluntarily electing to go through this experience. Okay? John chapter 19, we've already done that. Now, come with me to Matthew 26 again. I mentioned that there were two cups. Matthew 26. Three times Jesus prays, let this cup pass for me, let this cup pass for me, let this cup pass for me. But remarkably, earlier in that very chapter, there was another cup. There was another cup. And I want you to see this. Matthew 26, verse 26. That's easy to remember. 26, 26. It says, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread. This is prior to Gethsemane. This is prior to Calvary. So Jesus knows what's coming. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took, verse 27, the what? What did he take? He took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them. And he said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when he had sung a hymn, he went out to the Mount of Olives. And from the Mount of Olives, he ends up in, in Gethsemane. Now, this is interesting because Jesus establishes the Lord's Supper. He establishes the, the bread and the wine. And the disciples don't have a clue. They, they, don't, they, they, don't, they don't see Calvary. They certainly don't yet see the resurrection. They don't know what's going on here. They just know that Jesus handed them some bread and said, this is my body. And he handed them some, a cup, the wine. And he said, uh, drink this because this, this is the cup of, of the forgiveness or the remission of sins. 
Now, it, the text doesn't expressly say this, but I think it intimates that Jesus himself did not drink of that cup. I want to say that again. The text does not expressly say that Jesus did not drink of the cup, but I think it, it strongly intimates that Jesus gave it because he said, you drink all of it. All of you drink the cup. And then he said, it's almost as if they offered him some, and he said, no, I actually won't drink of this until the day that I drink it new with you in the kingdom. See, see Jesus knew that while they were going to drink the cup of communion, and, and look at the root word there, union, community, connectivity. Jesus gave them the cup. This is the cup of reconciliation. This is the cup of connection. This is the cup of love. This is the cup of communion. This is the cup of relationship. You guys drink this cup because Jesus knows that in just a few short hours, he'll be drinking a very different cup. In fact, the only way that they get to drink the communion cup is that Jesus drank, drank out of the separation cup. Three times he said, I don't want to drink this cup, Father. I don't want to drink this cup. I don't want to drink this cup. What was in that cup? Of course, it wasn't a literal cup. This was Jesus tasting what no human being had ever tasted before, even though millions of people had died before Jesus went to Gethsemane. Millions of people had died before that. Right? People had been dying all the way since the dawn of time. There had been, there had been thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of people that had died from heart attacks and, and swords and spears and accidents and, and horse, you know, falling off of a horse or whatever it might. People, lots of people have died. But what's happening here with Jesus is a totally new, totally unique thing. Jesus is not dying the first death, the end of biological processes. Jesus is dying the second death. His soul is dying. He's experiencing what Scripture calls the second death. This is how the author of Hebrews puts it. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see him, speaking of Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might, and look at these last four words here, what might he do? Taste death for everyone. Now, this is, this is a very interesting passage, and it's hugely insightful, because what the author of Hebrews says is, Jesus had to be made lower. He had to voluntarily become subject to death. We talked about this the other night, where God, in the incarnation, became subject to forces that he himself had created. God is not subject to death. He is himself, the I am, the one who is and who always has been and who always will be. So God in his divinity, God in the fullness of his godness is not subject to death, right? He's impervious to death. He's inoculated from death by virtue of his divinity. So in order for God to die, he had to become susceptible to death. He had to become something that could die. And this is the mystery of the incarnation, the, the enfleshing of God, where God becomes, as the author of Hebrews says, a little lower than the angels so that he could experience death and that he would taste death for every man. But this is a fascinating point because as we've already mentioned, thousands and millions of people had died before Jesus ever died. How is he tasting death for, for Carl and Lucy and Rebecca and Tim and John and, and Miranda who had all died many hundreds and thousands of years before Jesus had lived? No, 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 no. See, Jesus isn't just dying the Lazarus death. Jesus isn't dying, dying the death of the person, of the young girl who was in the upper room when Jesus said, she's asleep. No, 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 no. What's happening to Jesus before there was ever a nail placed in his hands, before there was ever a spear placed in his side, before he was ever flagellated or raised up on a cross, Jesus was dying something far more significant and far more terrifying than the death of the biological processes of the human body. Jesus was dying in his soul when his psyche, when his psyche was being, as it were, erased from existence. This is the second death. This is what Jesus was speaking of when he said, oh, psh, don't be afraid of those that kill the body but can't destroy the soul. Don't even worry about that. All those people can do is put you to sleep. In fact, that's what we actually put on tombstones, or at least used to put on tombstones. Rest in peace. That is not what's happening to Jesus. That is not what is happening to Jesus. I want to conclude with just this simple idea here. Scripture says the wages of sin is death. But every one of us in this room will die if Jesus doesn't return in our lifetime. Every one of us will die. Right? That's just, that's just part of, the, of the, the reality that there are free radicals doing their thing in our system. We're aging. We're getting older. Cancer's doing its thing. We're, we're, every one of us will die. But the death that we will die biologically is not the death that Jesus came to save us from. Right? Don't get me wrong. I'm not looking forward to that part either. But what happens after the, the first death is this resurrection. 
Okay? And we've already seen that there's a resurrection of life and there's this resurrection of condemnation. We might take this up a little bit tomorrow night, but we probably won't end up having time. When Jesus raises people in the resurrection, the resurrection of life, they are now impervious to death. God gives them the gift of, Im of, eter of eternal life. Okay? In those that are raised to, to the resurrection of condemnation, those who come, they are actually, ex they experience the second death. The second death. In other words, and time doesn't allow me to get into too much depth here, but they suffer what Scripture calls hell. And I'll simply say this. Hell is less a place and more an event. Okay? Hell, hell is not something you could plot right now on a GPS and be like, okay, where is it? And take a left, and then it's two rights. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to find hell. There actually is a hell in Michigan. When, when Scripture speaks... <laughs> it's true. When, when Scripture speaks about hell. It's talking about an event, right? Jesus said, don't fear him that can destroy the body, but cannot uh, destroy the soul, but rather fear him who destroys both body and soul in hell. There will be an event when God will finally and fully give people over to the consequences of their bad choices if they insist on harboring and, and retaining those things that ultimately lead to death. God will honor that choice. As C.S. Lewis famously said, at the end of time, there will be two kinds of people. Those that say to God, thy will be done. And those to whom God says, thy will be done. Okay, and our fifth and final reason here. Jesus' resurrection is the believer's guarantee of the rescue from death. This is the great story. In fact, I'll show you this. Acts chapter 2, verse 24, NIV. But God raised him, Jesus, from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. And there's a couple reasons for this. The first reason, or maybe one primary reason that I'll deal with here. The reason that Jesus was, could not be held or could not be retained by death is that he had committed no sin. So death had no legal or, or, or um, uh, it had no right to him. It had no right to, to retain him or to keep him. Paul says it this way in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, but I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those who have what? Fallen asleep. There's our language again. Lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Anybody here believe that? I believe that. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again. Okay, what? Even so... God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. The, Thess the church in Thessalonica was concerned that people were dying and they thought Jesus was going to come right away. And we talked about this last night. You can't get to B until you first have A and you can't get to A until the restrainer is removed. We talked about this. This is the same church. And they were concerned. Hey, uh, uh, you know, Aunt Matilda died and Uncle Eddie's gone and where, you know, where, where's, the, where's the return of Jesus? And he's like, no, 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 no. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't be ignorant. Even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain to the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are what? Asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. What's the next word? together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall ever be with the Lord. And just a word on this. When Jesus was speaking to his disciples, he didn't say to Peter, hey, Peter, you're going to die in about 25 years. I'll see you in 25 years when you get to heaven. He didn't turn to James and say, James, you're going to be, you know, you'll die before Peter, so I'll see you in about 12 years. He didn't say to him, hey, I'll see you, and I'll see you, and I'll see you, and I'll see you, and I'll see you. What he said is, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am you may be also. All of the disciples will be gathered together at the same time as everybody else who's ever been asleep in Jesus. So this notion that when you die, you're whoop, whisked away into heaven, and people are already up there, and they're like sort of waiting for you to show up, that is not what's happening. What happens is, is that all of the righteous are asleep in Jesus. That's what Paul says. They're asleep in Jesus. They're awaiting the resurrection. And just as when you sleep, you're unaware, right? You go to sleep, and the next thing you know, you wake up. And so when you're asleep in Jesus, whatever it was that happened to you, oh, the car was spinning out of control, or the helicopter, you know, began to, or whatever it is, the next thing you know, right? So pra practically it's the very same experience for the deceased. The next thing you know is the shining face of Jesus returning in the second coming. 
In other words, experientially, it's the very same thing, whether or not you believe that the moment you die, you go straight to heaven, or the moment you die, you sleep the sleep of death unconsciously and await the resurrection. Experientially, it's identical. You see that? But there are two amazing things that believing Bible truth actually helps us with. The first is, is that once we understand the biblical truth that people are sleeping in their graves and awaiting the resurrection, we will make no efforts or overtures to try to communicate with the dead. Which God strictly forbids. He says, nah, uh-uh, uh-uh. You're not, you're not, you're not talking to who you, think, who you think you're talking to. Okay, that's number one. And number two, it gives us a hope that all of us as one big redeemed family will get to the pearly gate, so to speak, at the same time and we'll all go rushing into the giant amusement park, which is the heavenly realm, at the same time. It's not like you're going to get there, like, yeah, I've already been on that ride. <laughs> yeah, no, I did that. You should have been here. You should have been here yesterday. It was way better. No, that's not what's happening. <laughs> and then you have that, you know, the whole little concern about, you know, like uh, the husband dies and then the wife's like, well, I can't remarry because, you know, my, he'll be looking down. He's seeing me with my, this, I can't do that. Not all of that. No, there's nothing to it. Absolutely nothing to it. People are in the graves. They are, they're sleeping and they are awaiting the resurrection. That's what Paul says. And notice this. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. When Paul was writing to people who had had loved ones that had passed away, he didn't say, hey, in his pastoral empathy, he didn't say, hey, comfort them with the words that their loved ones are already in glory. He said, comfort them with the words that God won't forget them. He won't leave them in the grave. They will be resurrected. Right? And even Jesus, remember when he went and he said, hey, your brother Lazarus is going to rise again. Martha's like, well, I know that. He'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. See, she knew. She knew what would happen. The resurrection will take place at the the last day. And again, I can't emphasize strongly enough, experientially, it's the same. The very next conscious moment is the face of Jesus. Revelation chapter 1 verse 18 opens with these words, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. I have the keys of Hades and of death. I love that. Jesus has the keys to the car, man. He has driven that. He, he has the keys and he can go down to every grave, to every, people say, well, what happened to the person that got burned by fire? Jesus can put them back together. He's got the resources of omnipotence at his disposal. What about the sailors that drowned and were eaten by crabs? And Jesus will put them back together. It's not like Jesus needs some physical, oh man, I can't put him back together. I ran out of, where's his DNA? I don't know where it's at. No. No, 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 no. Jesus can put people back together because, and here's the beauty, all of us in all of our complexity and our beauty and the unique person that makes us us, all of that exists in the mind and in the heart of God. And scripture says that when God puts us back together bodily, physically, we're actually going to come off looking a lot better. And you guys look good today, don't get me wrong, but you're going to look even better because we've all been uglified to some degree by sin. And we're going to be, uh, as the New Testament says, we're going to be in our heavenly home, in our heavenly house. And uh, we don't even yet know what that will be like. Scripture says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. Jesus showed this marvelous love. How did he do it? Greater love has no one than this, and a man would lay down one's life for his friends. And that's what Jesus did. And I say it this way, inasmuch as it was possible for God to die, he did. I want to say that again. In as much as it was possible for God to experience death, he did. In fact, no human being, no other human being, none, no creature at this point right now, 2015, has experienced the second death. Nobody. None. None have experienced the second death. Lots of people have died the first death and are in the graves waiting the resurrection. But only one being has experienced the second death, the death not only of the body, of the ceasing of the biological processes, but the death of the soul. The only being that has experienced that was Jesus. But death didn't have any legitimate legal right to him, and so he rose again from the grave. Isn't this awesome? And, and there's just another, uh, another word on that. And this is huge to me. I remember the first time I had this thought, I about fell over. There will be people who will die the second death, people that insist on having their own way, and God will give them over to their, to their own choices. God will give them up to the consequences of the choices that they have made. But check this out. This is remarkable. God doesn't let anybody experience the second death until he has experienced it himself first. You get that? In other words, God says, no, 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 no. Nobody's walking through this door until I do. 
even, this is exactly what's meant when it says that he tasted death for every man. There's an experiential, there's something experiential about tasting, and clearly it was something Jesus did not want to taste, because three times he prayed in Gethsemane, take this cup away, take this cup away, I do not want to drink this. But God said, nope, before anybody, any creature, any person experiences that, I'll experience it. And I want to tell you, friends, that is love. That's what Jesus was talking about. Greater love has no man than this, and a man would, than one would lay down his life for his friends. No longer do I call you servants. A servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you what? Friends. So here we go. Reason number one, death is not a punishment from God, but something that God is trying to save us from. Say amen if that makes sense. Deacons, you got my cards here to pass out? You got my cards? Okay, pass out those cards. I'll look at these guys right on the spot. Number two, there are two kinds of death. The first death and the second death. And we've spent enough time on that. I don't have to re revisit that. Deacons are going to place a card in your hand very similar to the one that we had last night. I want to walk through that with you. Quickly finish up this review. Number three, Scripture warns against trying to make contact with the deceased for the reasons that we've already laid out. You're not talking to who you think you're talking to. And to me, it's fascinating that we live in a world that is increasingly uh, intrigued by and curious by this idea that we can talk to the... It, the whole thing is a grand deception. And uh, I could spend more time on that. I'm not going to right now. Number four, Jesus died the second death, not just the first. And then number five, Jesus' resurrection is the believer's guarantee from death. Guarantee of res rescue. Okay, everybody has a card in their hand. There's a little pencil there. I want to walk you through this. I want to thank you all for filling out the card last night. Hugely helpful to me, but we have a lot of people here this morning who were not here last night. And even if you were here last night, I want to ask you to please fill this out. The first one says, number one, I believe that Jesus died and rose again. As you put your name, your address, all that information on there, please fill that out. But the first one, I want to know, and this is an opportunity for you just to confess with your, with your own response to God and to his word, I believe that Jesus died and rose again. Check that. Check. Number two, and, and this is really helpful to me as a communicator, I want to see if it's been clear. I believe that Jesus died the second death for me and for everyone. And maybe I should just say a brief word about that. Jesus even died the second death for those who will also die their own second death. In other words, everyone, will, everyone who is lost will be needlessly lost. Scripture intimates this when it says, depart, when Jesus is speaking about the fires of hell, he says, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. In other words, there was never any, God's design was never that a human being would experience this. I want to know if that's clear. Number three. I choose not to be afraid of death, but to trust in Jesus' death, resurrection, and love. I tell you, beloved, the gospel sets us free from the fear of death, but it sets us free from more just the fear of death. The gospel sets us free from that which causes death, which is sin. Did you get that? The gospel sets us free from that which causes death, which is sin. It literally liberates us to live the life that God created us to live. Lives of love, of holiness, of relational happiness, connection, beauty, Number four, and these are the same that were there last night. If you filled them out, check them again anyway. That'd be great. Number four, I would like Bible studies and or a visit from the pastor. Please. Number five, I would like to be baptized in Jesus' name. And let me just say a word on this, just very quickly. When somebody is baptized, here's what's happening. And it's astonishing to me how many Christians don't get this. I, 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 as a pastor, I spend a lot of time with, with uh, well-meaning parents who are, want their children to be baptized. And uh, I, I like inquiring of parents. Like, hey, what do you, you'd like to see your son or daughter baptized? How old are they? You know, we practice, uh, I believe, in believe, uh, believer's baptism, not infant baptism. There's no biblical text for, for infant baptism. So when I talk to parents, I'll be like, so why do you, know, why do you want your child to be baptized? You know, why, why do you think they, he or she might be ready? Say they're 12 or 13 or whatever it is. And I would say out of 10 parents, maybe six. Oh, that sounds nice. <laughs> Little appeal song. That's all right. Just keep it going, girl. <laughs> I would say if I ask 10 sets of parents, not more than three give me the right answer. I'm, t I'm telling you this as a pastor. I say, hey, why do you want your child to be baptized? Le about three will give the right answer. And then when I meet people who themselves want to be baptized, I say, hey, listen, you want to get baptized? 
and they'll give, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying if you don't get exactly the right theological answer, you can't be baptized. But it's, it's amazing to me how, many, how few people just don't even understand what's happening in baptism. I'm going to give you the, the 60 second, maybe the 120 second version. Here's what happens. In, in biblical thinking and Hebrew thinking, when you're breathing, you're alive. God breathed into Ast uh, Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. So when you're breathing, you're alive. This is why Scripture makes a strong emphasis and says he breathed his last. He breathed his last. He breathed, okay, you, you're dead. When you stop breathing, you're dead. This is just a basic, you know, observational reality. Okay, so here's what's happening. When you get baptized, you go into the water, right? You stand up, say, to your waist, and you are breathing, which means you're alive. But you then are placed by the pastor or the officiant, officiant under the water. Okay, in order to go underwater, because we're air-breathing creatures, you have to hold your breath. Now, biblically speaking, when you hold your breath, you have just symbolically experienced the cessation of breath, namely death. Not only have you experienced the cessation of breath, namely death, you've been buried in the water. So you've gone into the water. But we don't leave you there, which is good news. It's actually very, it's quite painless, in fact. You then come back up and watch what happens. Watch what happens. When you come out of the water, just like what happens when a woman gives birth, her water breaks, the child comes out of the water and then <gasps> takes the first breath. When you come up, you take your first breath. And Scripture says this is being born again. Born again. You are now breathing for the first time as a believer. You were born into Adam, into the world of Adam. You're born again into Jesus. And here's what you're saying when you're, when you're baptized. You're saying, the death that Jesus died was the death that I deserved. The burial that Jesus experienced in the grave was the burial that should have been mine. And his resurrection is my only hope. <gasps> of living, of taking that breath and having eternal life. That's what you're saying in baptism. It's not a Christian graduation ceremony. It's not even saying that I believe the 28 fundamental beliefs or I believe whatever this church teaches. You are saying publicly the death that Jesus died was the death that I deserved. The burial that he experienced was the burial that should have been mine. And his resurrection is my only hope of eternal life. That's what you're saying. And I want to say a word about this. Forgive me for being pointed here. I'm going to put a really fine tip on this. If you were baptized and that's not what you were saying... You took a swim with your pastor. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm dead serious. If you were baptized and, and you were not saying with some degree of intelligence, you don't have to be a theologian, but whether you were 12 or 22 or 42 or 52, if, if you don't understand that what you were saying is the death that Jesus died was the death that I deserved, the life that he lived is the life I have not lived, the burial that he experienced is the burial that I deserved, and his resurrection is my only hope of a future resurrection. If you were saying anything other than that, then you took a swim with your pastor. And people say to me, they'll come to me and say, hey, do I need to be re-baptized? I say to them, no, 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 you don't need to be re-baptized. You need to be baptized. Because you never had it one in the first place. Are, are you following me? And so this, this great truth of baptism fits in perfectly with this text, or with this message, excuse me. So number one, I want to be baptized. I need to, I want to be baptized. Number six, if you have questions about that, by the way, you can mark it down. Myself and or Jamie will come and visit you. Number six says, I have a prayer request. Write it on the reverse side. Number seven, I have enjoyed this series and would like to be notified of other events at this church. Check it. And with that said, I'm going to invite you to fill those out. Pass them, which way do you like, Jamie, to the outside? Pass them to the outside, and I want to close with prayer. Have you learned anything today? Okay, tomorrow evening... We're going to have uh, two presentations, one of which I don't know what it's going to be yet, but the other one is called Five Good Reasons to be Nervous about the United States. Five Good Reasons to be Nervous about the United States. We're going to pick up where we left off last night. And uh, I don't know what the other one is yet. It's a surprise, even to me. All right, so pass those to the outside and let's close with prayer. Father in heaven, we stand amazed. We, we marvel at this great truth of the fact that we don't have to be afraid of death because Jesus tasted death for every person. And Father, we are, we are thrilled to know that the death of the body is, is just what Jesus called asleep. Our friend Lazarus is asleep. The little girl is asleep. Stephen was stoned and he fell asleep. And Father, I, I, I think of my grandmother and my grandfather, two very dear, beautiful people to me, people that I love with all of my heart. And Father, even now they sleep in Jesus waiting for the resurrection. Father, I want to pray for every person in this room, from the youngest to the oldest, that we would be making decisions today, right here, right now,
to orient our lives according to the principles of your word, the principles of scripture, the law of the spirit of life, as Paul says, that we might orient our lives according to holiness and love and virtue and goodness and your commandments. And Father, teach us how to do that, how to live with relational integrity, with kindness and with beauty. To live